remember a story about VBS. It was a guy, he was a biker dude, big guy. He called him Big Blue. And Big Blue came to Jesus. Well, he showed up at church, and they're asking him if he wants to get involved with something. So they asked Big Blue to help out with BBS, Vacation Bible School. So he shows up with his suitcase. If you're going on vacation, you take your suitcase, right? We use terminology in church that we just assume everybody knows what we're talking about. And said that he went in there and said, the next thing you know, he said the teacher, there was two teachers in there with him. One of them said, I need to go get something. I'll be back in a minute. And she went out the door. A few minutes later, they said, I need to go get something. And she went out the door. And he said, there I was with a room full of five-year-olds. And said, they started tearing the, tearing the room apart. And he, he said, all I knew was if they tear this room apart, I'm going to be in trouble. So he said, earth children. Said it got quiet as a mouse. The teachers came back in. He had them all sitting down there, and he was, he was talking like that to them. And one of them said, Big Blue, we want you to come home with us. Says, my mom and daddy's never met an alien before. <laughs> come on, God can use anybody, can he? Amen. He can use you. Amen. Well, praise God. I have no idea where I'm going with this this morning. I told the worship team I worked for hours on a sermon trying to put it together, and it just didn't come together. So I just pulled something out, and we're going to see where it goes. Amen. Because it's Palm Sunday, and I'm supposed to be talking about Jesus coming into the city and his triumphal entry. That's what these palm branches are about. Can I have one of those? Thank you, Lisa. They waved palm branches as he came in because if you remember, he sent his disciples into the city and said, you're going to find a donkey tied that no man has ever set upon. And you untie him and bring him to me. And if somebody asks you what you're doing, say, the master has need of him. And said, he'll let you have the donkey. And he brings it to him. And they set a blanket on the donkey's back. Now, this is, God, God's in this. You, have you ever tried to ride a, a, a donkey or a, or a horse for the first time? You don't just put a blanket on his back and just sit on it. He, he doesn't like that. And you're not going to sit there long because he's going to throw you off. But this was God was in this. And so he sits on him, and they bring him in, and they're waving palm branches. This is actually was a symbol of Zionism. Today it's, the, it's the, the Jewish flag. It's got the Star of David on it. But then it was this. This was a threat to the Roman Empire because when they're doing this, what they're saying is we are identifying ourselves as an independent nation free from you. And we are acknowledging that the man that is coming into the city now is our king, not not the, the Caesar. And so this was, they were making a statement, and they're laying blankets in the way, and that was in fulfillment of the prophecy that the Messiah would come riding the colt, uh, riding a colt uh, um, that had never been ridden before. And so he was fulfilling prophecy as he fulfilled many different prophecies. And it's one of the things that is irrefutable proof of the Scripture is the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, hundreds of them in minute detail. So what that tells me is that the prophecies that remain about him and what he's going to do, guess what? He's going to fulfill those too, amen? And so we celebrate Palm Sunday. Actually, this is a special day for CVAG. If you're joining such Central Virginia Assembly of God, CVAG we call it for short, because actually we planted the church in 1997. In 1998, we had our very first service in this building. Well, not the new building, in the old building over there at this facility on this property on Palm Sunday. That was our very first service on this property was on Palm Sunday. So today is our anniversary. 23 years ago, we met for the first time on this property. And, and uh, Pastor Joel and I, we came up here. It was an old school building. The windows was all knocked out of it. Weeds growed up all over it. There were beer cans all up inside of it where people had been partying out back and stuff. And he and I took a bottle of oil, and we anointed, we anointed the driveway coming into this place. We went around and anointed the, 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 the lintel, the doorpost. We reached inside the broken windows in the back and poured oil up inside the building. And we said, God, we want the presence of your spirit to be here always. We declare that this is holy ground, and we claim this property for Yeshua. 
for you, Jesus. This is your place. And, and God has spoken some wonderful prophecies over the year. One of them is that this is my church, and I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's not just a scripture. It's a word that God spoke over this place. And brother, let me tell you, the gates of hell has fought against it many times over. But we're still here. Amen. And it's got nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with Pastor Joel. Amen. It's all about him. Always has been. This is his church, not my church. It's his church. Amen. And he's going to continue to build it. So Palm Sunday is a very special day. Jesus come riding in on a donkey. Everybody's eyes was on him and we, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because they've been waiting. This is what they're waiting for. And they're expecting him to go straight into the, he went to the temple, he cleaned out the temple, if you remember, and they're like, yes, on to Pilate's house. Let's throw him out, throw the Roman government out, and we're going to establish our own kingdom because they're looking at the prophecies of the second time he comes because the next time he comes, his eyes will be like fire. Come on, a sword will proceed out of his mouth that he will consume the enemy. He'll have his feet polished like brass, and he'll be wearing a breastplate. And on his thighs, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And so that's what they were expecting. It's going to be different when he comes again. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5, the latter part of it says, this is a description, Zechariah prophesying of his second coming. And he says, and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. Verse 9, it says, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. There, uh, shall there be one Lord and his name one. Verse 12, it says, and this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall go among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against his the hand of his neighbor. So when Jesus comes back again, it's going to be different. Amen? This is what they were expecting when he rode in on the donkey. But he's coming back again, and it's going to be different. <laughs> Church, it's a really bad idea to provoke God. Amen? Amen. Listening world, you're tuning in. It's a really bad idea to provoke God. Knowing that, why do so many nations do so? Why do they do that? And what is God going to do to them? We know that Jesus uh, is going to return. We know what he's going to do when he returns. But the question I want to address this morning is what about now? I know what he did when he rode in on the donkey. I know in Scripture what, he has, what he's going to do when he comes again. What about now? What is God going to do to, to those nations that turn their back on God today? Let's pray before we get into the word. Father, we ask, God, that you just speak truth to us today, God, not that we're here to, God, we're not just here to try to frighten people, Lord. Lord, we are here to try to sound an alarm, God. It's, oh, God, it's time for people to wake up. Wake up from their sleep, Lord, and their slumber, and realize, God, that, that you have given us instructions, commands, statutes, and orders, and laws, and we absolutely must follow them, Lord. And if we don't, we will, without question, reap the consequences of our actions. Not just as individuals, but, Lord, as, as nations and kingdoms and peoples, Lord. So, Father, I pray that you just send out a wake-up call this morning through this message, Lord, as I preach it as best I can. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we're living in a disturbing time. People are looking for answers. I mean, when you look at the state of the nation right here in America, it doesn't look good. 
I just heard a report this week about a man in Canada whose daughter wanted to have sex changes made, and they did this against his will. And they insisted that he refer to her as him, as a boy. And because he would not do that, he's in jail right now. They put him in prison because he refused to call his daughter a he. It's coming to America, church. Not only do they believe and accept this, they're going to force you at the threat of the power of the nation and the law to accept it and support it and enforce it. And so it's, it's bad. Now, I know to, today some of this sounds like bad news. It's doom and gloom, but it's better to face the truth than to get blindsided by it. Amen? To go on and stick in your head in the sand is not an option. And those who are in charge of making all these laws, they need to understand it's a really bad idea to provoke God. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus talks about that in verse 20. He says, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they would not repent. Verse 21, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Verse 25, and at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. How many of you want to be a baby? Huh? Come on, I'd rather be a babe in Christ and know these things. Even so, verse 26, Father... For so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son will, wills to reveal him. Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden. Come on, he's talking to us today, church. Come on, am I reading the Word of God or not? He's talking to us. Come unto me. If you labor and you're heavy laden, and I might give you rest. No, he said, I will give you rest. How many of you want to rest in Jesus? In this troublesome times. Verse uh, 29, take my yoke up on you and learn from me. You know what that's talking about? He's talking about he'll take two oxen, and one's an old oxen. He knows exactly what to do. When they put that yoke on that dude, he just pulls whatever's behind him. He knows exactly what to do. He knows all the commands. He knows what G means, and he knows what ha means. G means turn one way, and ha means turn the other. And he obeys the command of the master. Jesus is that oxen. He knows the voice of his father. And he says, take my yoke upon you, because what they would do is put the yoke on the old ox, and then they would put the yoke on a young ox that didn't have a clue what to do. And he would learn from the old ox. Sometimes the old ox is pulling the load and the young ox. So that's what he's saying. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle. Everybody say gentle. I'm lowly in heart. He's not hard-hearted. He's not bitter. He's not angry. He's lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he came on a donkey, but he's coming back again. What is he going to do in the meantime? 
I believe there's a message in this that is a warning to the nations. Now, let's look at Chorazin and Bethsaida. He does more miracles in these cities during his earthly ministry than any other cities. And Bethsaida is called the house of hunting. In other words, this is the country boys. That, this is us right here, okay? Thank God I'm a country boy. I am, brother. I'm going to tell you what, if there's more than one red light in town, I start getting nervous. I was born, I'm country born and country bred, brother. I'm going to tell you, I went to D.C. one time and, oh my, I, the, the light was red, you know. I wanted to get to the other side, so I just kept walking. There was a police officer on the other side. He said, didn't you see me standing here? I said, well, actually, I didn't. He said, you can't walk across when that light's red. I said, brother, let me tell you something. There's one red light in my town. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fish out of water up here. I'm sorry if I've offended you. But I can promise you if I can just get out of here, <laughs> you won't have to worry about me anymore because I won't be back unless somebody makes me. I had to be there then or I wouldn't have been there that time, amen. So Bethsaida, that's us. He's talking to the country boys and to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is a Mediterranean sea. It's the inner city metropolitan. So he's talking to the folks in the country, the folks in the city. They were wealthy. They were industrious. They were commercial. And he says about them, you were exalted to the heavens. So what he is talking about, it denotes great privilege. He meant that they were especially favored. They were given instruction. They were prosperous. They were very wealthy. Most of all, they were favored by the presence of Jesus. Out of all the cities, this is where he hung out the most. So they're favored with his presence, with the preaching of Jesus and with the miracles that he had done. He spent a large portion of his ministry there, and he performed most of his chief miracles were done there. But he tells them in verse 23, you were exalted to heaven, but you're going to be brought down to hell, Hades. He's warning them and trying to save them from wrath. Their privilege, their honor, their wealth, economy, industry, and commerce would be taken away and they would sink as low as they had been exalted. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Stay with me. This has been fulfilled. So you wonder what, we know what he's going to do when he comes again, but what about now? He's warning these cities, if you don't repent, even though you were exalted to heaven, you were favored with my presence, my preaching, the miracles of God, even though all of that, I've done all those things in your city, you're going to be brought down as low as you've been exalted if you don't repent. And it was fulfilled when the Jews and the Romans went to battle against each other. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum was completely desolated, just like Tyre and Sidon and Sodom were. So you say, how does all of that apply to us today? Well, I think the message is clear. Judgment will overtake a people, a nation, a kingdom, cities, which are guilty of wickedness, and they do not repent. Now, that's true about a nation. And this is what I was struggling with this week, because I, I had actually started working on this sermon before I started working on the other one, because <laughs> I was wanting to preach on this this week. But all week long, I kept hearing, harden not your heart. Be ye kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you of your trespasses. Let me tell you something, church. Last Sunday, I preached about grace, and it occurred to me this week, grace doesn't even begin until someone has done you wrong. If you do good to me and I do good to you, that's not grace. 
You've earned that. Grace is unmerited favor. If you've done good to me and I do good to you, that's just goodness. You, you've earned that. You deserve that. But when you do me wrong and I do good to you because I will not harden my heart, I will be tenderhearted. I will be kind to you. I will forgive you just like God forgave me. Did we deserve forgiveness? Does anybody in here deserve the forgiveness of God? No. He did that for Jesus' sake. That's grace. That's unmerited favor. And I hear God saying to the church, because people are becoming hard-hearted, you do them wrong, they get mad at you. They retaliate. They leave. They do this. They do that. That's not kindness. That's not being tender-hearted. That's not forgiving one another, just like God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. And church, I'm telling you, that the wrath of God will be poured out against people, cities, and nation who do not follow his command. He told the children of Israel, harden not your heart as your fathers did in the provocation in the wilderness, where they saw my miracles for 40 years, but they tested me and they tempted me. And they fell in the wilderness and were not allowed to enter my rest. That's Hebrews chapter 3, I think. That tells me something else. Hardening your heart is something you do. God doesn't harden your heart. Other people doing you wrong, they don't harden your heart. You harden your heart. Because he says, harden not your heart. If your heart's hard, it's because you've made it hard. And he says, be kind one to another. Tender hearted. If your heart is tender, it's because you've made it tender. You have to choose these things. They don't just happen. God will not give you a tender heart. You have to choose to be tender hearted. You have to choose to be kind. You have to choose to be forgiving. You have to choose to give grace when people have done you wrong. When you don't like what they've done, you don't like what they've done to somebody else. The next thing you know, you're all over them and you're talking bad about them and tearing them down. You're disobeying God and you need not expect his blessing because it will not come. If he blesses you when you do that, he owes Sidon, Sodom, and Tyre an apology. Because he brought wrath against them because they disobeyed God. And if he doesn't bring judgment, he owes them an apology. Because he's a just God. Amen? Yeah. Well, anyway, that was what was burning in my heart this week. And you got the whole, let me get back to what I was. I'm trying to tie all this together. Brother, have you ever tried to put dots together that don't, ain't even on the same page? I told the worship team, I said, you ought to try to do this every week. Oh, it's fun. Pull your hair out. I don't have any left to pull out. So it's clear that God is going to pour out his wrath on those that are guilty of wickedness. The wicked will suffer for their sins. Sodom, Gomorrah, Sidon, Tyre. But also the wicked will suffer in proportion to the privilege that God has given to them. The more severe judgment will fall on Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum than the judgment that fell on Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom. See, Tyre and Sidon, that was before. Jesus didn't do any miracles there. He didn't do any miracles in Sodom and Gomorrah. He hadn't even come then. But the wrath that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah was not measure in severity to the wrath that's going to fall on, 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 Ty- on um, Capernaum and Bethsaida. Because that's where he had given them privilege and favor. And so the wrath of God, I believe, is going to be in severity to the measure of what what has God done for you? What has God done for you? If God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me and I refuse to forgive others, I will receive the wrath of God in proportion to what he has done for me that I refuse to do for others. Church, we need to wake up. Start treating each other like Jesus would treat people.
Jesus brought the revelation of the kingdom to Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. But after they heard the truth, they turned from the truth and were overtaken in a lie. Therefore, the judgment will be greater than if they had never heard it at all. See, there are, I believe, different levels of judgment, different levels of wrath. That's why we have a judgment. If everybody's getting the same thing, What's the point of the judgment? I've always believed that, but we can kind of see that in this. There's different levels of reward. There's different levels of judgment and punishment. So where does that leave America? Great Britain, Germany, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Colossia, all these places, where does that leave all them? So then that gave, brought up the question, will God judge America? Will you tell me, has America been favored with God's presence? Yeah. His blessing? Oh, yeah. Preaching of the word? There's been probably more sermons brought in and through America than any place on the planet ever in history, ever. The miracles in greater degree, even a greater degree than Capernaum and Chorus and Bethsaida. There's been more miracles in America over the, the years. She had the revelation of the kingdom, then turned from the truth, and she's been overtaken in a lie. How many of you believe that? Yeah. America's been overtaken in a lie. Yeah. I mean, how many of you have heard of David Barden? You should get his series on, what's the name of it? The, the God Builders is the name of his website, but it's, he's got a whole series on, on the, the history of, of America. The, heritage, heritage of, the American Heritage Series. The American Heritage Series. You ought to get that. And, and see the thread, the divine thread of God in the formation of this nation. See the reverence and the respect and, the, and, and the, the relationship that our founding fathers had with God. You couldn't even serve in government unless you believed in, in, in Jesus Christ and, and, and believed in the deity of Christ and believed in who he was. The formation of all of the constitutions of every state is just saturated with Christianity. Yeah. This nation has got its roots in Christianity. And now our government is turning their back completely on that. So will God judge America? Will you tell me? When a nation's leaders enact and enforce laws that are contrary to the laws of God, when human behavior that is perverted, it's immoral, it's unethical, even unthinkable, becomes the rule of law, and when those behaviors are celebrated as normal and acceptable by the citizens of that nation, how can God not judge that nation? One commentator put it this way, and if they of ancient days suffered thus, talking about Capernaum, if more tremendous judgment fell on them than even on on guilty Sodom, what shall be the doom of those who go down to hell from this day of light? The Savior was indeed there a few days. He worked a few miracles, but they had not, as we have, all his instructions. See, they didn't have the completed word of God like we do. They had not Sunday schools. Bible classes, stated preaching of the gospel, nor was the world blessed then as now with extensive and powerful revivals of religion. How awful must be the doom of those who are educated in the ways of religion, who are instructed from Sabbath to Sabbath, who grow up amid the means of grace and then are lost. Matthew eleven twenty, 20, he said, he then began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Church, I'm going to tell you, if America doesn't repent, 
it's a really, really bad idea to provoke God. It really is. What will be the fate of this nation? Well, look at Sodom. Look at Tyre, Sidon, Chorazin, Basada, Capernaum. For their wickedness and rebellion against God. It looks bad. So what do we do as believers when we live in a nation that is ruled by evil men? We should remember that the first church was born and grew under such circumstances. We have to remember this, church, unless we lose heart. The first church was born under the wicked rule of a Caesar that was totally against God, against Christianity. They were pagans. They, they worshiped many gods and rejected the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not only that, they persecuted the Christians, taking them into the arena. They used them for sport. They would turn them in the arena and turn out wild dogs, lions, and tires, and bears, and stuff just to rip them apart. And they would cheer as this was happening. But the church grew during that period of time. An interesting point I find helpful, I find in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, this was the second church that was established during Paul's missionary journey. Philippi was the very first Gentile church to be established. If you're ever discouraged, read the book of Philippians. Amen? Yes. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known. The Lord is at hand. Yes. Amen? Whatsoever things are good and just and pure of a good report, if there any be in virtue and praise, think on these things, and the God of peace shall keep your heart and mind. Philippians is a good, encouraging book. Amen. Very first Gentile church. The second one was Thessalonica. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy on their second missionary journey established this. And because of the synagogue in Thessalonica was depleted in numbers. People were getting saved and leaving the Jewish synagogue and coming, starting to attend the meetings of the Christians. They were called people of the way back then. They weren't called Christians. People of the way. And so they had to, Paul had to get out of town. They ran him out of town. But he sent Timothy back, and Timothy has given him a report, and he's writing back to them on the condition of their church. And he's praising them for the healthy state of their church. Now, again, be, let me remind you that they are being persecuted on a scale far greater than anything we are witnessing in America at present. I mean, things are getting bad, but it wasn't that bad. And we should take courage that God can still rule no matter how bad it gets. Amen? And they're healthy. So I find this passage to be helpful for, for several reasons. One, it was written to a Gentile church, that would be us, that was under the rule of evil men. Now, I think that might would apply today. How about you? There is a healthy church in America. I believe this for all my life. It's still true. I believe that there's always been a remnant. I've been in some churches that was dead as last year's bird nest. Anybody ever been there? If Jesus showed up, they'd hand him a visitor's card. He's like, who are you? Welcome. But inside of that church, there was a remnant of people that loved the Lord. Because you see, the church is not brick and mortar. It's not this building. You are the body of Christ. And there is a healthy church in America. Always has been. I believe we're a part of that. I certainly hope we are. Trying awful hard to be that, amen? amen? And so this is written to us, the Gentile church that's under the rule of evil men. The second thing, it's a letter dealing with eschatology. Eschatology is just the word eschatos means things that are last. Ology is the study of the things that are last. Eschatology is the study of the last days. And this, the, the letter to Thessalonica was dealing with what's going to happen in the end times. Okay, so it's, it's encouraging me to know that this letter was actually written for you and I. I believe we're living in the last day. Because <clears throat> he talks about the rapture of the church and the day of the Lord in this, in this letter. Uh, the third thing that causes this to encourage me is that it was written to new converts telling them you need to stand. No matter what's going on, you need to stand. 
not only against the persecution, but also against the pressures to revert back to the former pagan standards. In other words, you need to take a stand when they tell you that you've got to accept a little girl that wants to be a little boy and call her a him. No, I'm not going to call you a him. God made you a her. And in my book, you will always be a her, a she. And so he's saying, take a stand. Don't revert back to the pagan ways that God brought you out of. And then the last thing, the reason it encourages me is this warning. The warning that's in this is specifically to the saints that will be here at the time of Jesus' return. That means this letter is a word of encouragement to you and I because we are living in that time right now. And it's here, he wrote it to encourage us. Look at it with me, First Thessalonians 5, verse 1. But concerning the time and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. All right? Now, I, I, I believe in the rapture of the church. People say the word rapture is not there. It actually is. It's the Greek word rapezo. It means rapture. It actually is in Scripture. We just translated it catching away or taken out. And uh, it's, it's going to happen secretly. The rapture of the church will be like a thief in the night. And right now, many people in the world and sadly in the church are sleeping. They're in darkness. They don't see this coming because they're sleeping. Church, they, they have to. If we're not obeying the Lord, if we understand what I thought about having to be tenderhearted in that, we understand that and we choose not to do it, we're sleeping. We need to wake up because God's not going to bless you if you don't follow his command, if you don't serve him. And so in that respect, a lot of people are sleeping. They're oblivious to what is happening and what is about to happen. Verse 3 says, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, see, he's separated. He's writing to the church now. He's talking about people in the church that's doing this and others that's doing that. He said some of them are sleeping, but you, brethren, those of us that are awake, that remnant, you, brethren, you're not in darkness so that this day, they're talking about the rapture, should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light. Come on, light reveals things. When you turn the light on, you see the bugs, amen? And the sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Now, what does, what does that mean, be sober? It doesn't, it's not talking about drinking alcohol, although you shouldn't be doing that either. Amen. Come on. I was just listening this week about the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, Sandy Rios. I, mean, I told you guys to tune her in every morning at 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock, from 8 to 9 on AFR, American Family Radio. You ought to tune her in if you can. But she was talking about, so she's a Southern Baptist. I grew up in a Southern Baptist. Come on, I love the Southern Baptist. All right. I owe a great deal of debt to them. A lot of the roots that I have came from the Southern Baptists. They are my friends. <laughs> they're just wrong on a few things, but that don't mean they're not saved. I disagree with them on the subject of unconditional security. I disagree with them on the subject of cessationism. They believe that the gifts of the Spirit passed away. I don't believe that. <laughs> And I don't believe that once you're saved, you're always saved, brother. There's five foolish virgins and five wise ones. They were all virgins. Five made it and five didn't. And I could go, I could go into that and prove that without any question. So, but that doesn't mean that they don't love Jesus. They do. They love the Lord, and I love them. You know, but they're, they're having a, a lot of trouble inside of their denomination now because they are, they are uh, accepting some things that, that God is against. They're sleeping, and she, she was talking about some of the th issues that they're having to deal with and some of the things that they're embracing. And I'll tell you guys, it's not a time to be backing off the Word of God. We need to be knuckling down on it. 
So to be sober is what, oh, what I was going to say about sobriety and drinking. She was talking about that in the, in the Baptist hymnal, in the back of it, we used to have responsive reading. Anybody ever, how many came from a Baptist roots? Raise your hand real high. You remember the responsive reading in the back of the hymnal book? The pastor would read something, then you'd read something. Well, in that was also the church covenant. And I grew up on this. Come on, this was, this was what I was, I was nurtured. This was my ninny. Okay. <laughs> and in the church covenant, it says, I will neither buy, sell, nor drink alcohol as a beverage. In the church covenant, that's what you agree to if you're a Southern Baptist. Teetotalers, they've always been. Well, they're not anymore. And it's causing a riff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So what? He, he's talking about being sober. It's a good idea. Come on. I, I just can't believe that God intended for alcohol to be inside your body. You put alcohol on a cut. But pouring alcohol inside your body, that just doesn't make sense to me. And I could preach on that. I think they're, they are finding, too, that there is a direct connection between alcohol and cancer. I might be wrong about that. If you're a medical professional, maybe you know more about that than I do. But anyway, it's a good idea to be sober. Pastor B's a teetotaler. Amen. If I sniffed the cork, I'd probably get high. You know, and, and if you're one of those people, you have a beer once in a while, I'm not going to tell you you're going to go to hell because you do that. I, it's, it's, you know, to me, if I went into the grocery store and you see me coming out with a six-pack of Miller Lights, what did that just do to my testimony? Right? Pastor had a six-pack of Miller Lights. What are you going to think next time you see me? It's like, he, he's not real. See, I worked construction most of my life, 25 years as a pipe fitter. I worked with all the guys that talk about you. And in their mind, Christians don't drink. And if they know you drink, they believe you're a hypocrite. That's the world now. So you can defend it if you want to. I just, I mean, that, to me, I would rather not. The Bible says that, that I, I actually have privilege, but it says if my liberty causes you to stumble, then don't do it. So maybe I can have a Bud Light, and it'd be all right. But I'm not, because that would cause you to stumble. And besides that, I don't need that. A glass of water will do me just fine. Amen? Now, if you drink, don't get mad at me. I'm just I'm trying to help you here, all right? I'm, I'm just trying to help you. You don't need it. Come on, you get, get, get high on Jesus. Man, I'm going to tell you, it's free. You don't wake up with a headache, a hangover, nothing, man. I'm going to tell you, you feel good when you get up. Some of you are like, I know what he's talking about. The guy get up next morning, well, I ain't never going to drink again. And then he's drunk the next weekend. <laughs> I get it. Anyway, be sober. Let me get back to where I was at. Exercising moderation and self-restraint in appetite and behavior. That's what that means. You exercise moderation and self-restraint in your appetites and your behavior, having or indicating an awareness of things as they really are. Being sober is seeing things for what they really are. So he tells you, awake from sleep, be sober, be watchful. Verse 7, he says, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we are awake, that means you're alive, or you're asleep, that means you're dead, we should live together with him. You say, well, pastor, I don't know what to do when the nation is turned against God. Well, you do what the Gentile church at Thessalonica did. You go to the instruction manual, and you follow the instructions. You watch. All right? That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm saying, all right, guys, join me in looking squarely at what's going on around us. You watch. Don't go stick your head in the sand. I don't hear that. La, 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 la. 
Because I do that. Now, I don't, I'm not talking about surrounding yourself with negativity because I don't like that either. I don't want to hear about this every day. I want to be aware of it, but this is not, I'm not addicted to it. I don't want to hear about what's going wrong in the world every day because Philippians, again, tells you whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things have a good report. If there's any faith or virtue, think on these things. Okay, don't think about what's going wrong in the world all the time because if you do, you're going to be downcast. I don't know anybody that's that strong. I'm certainly not. But we do need to be aware of the reality of what's going on. We need to watch, understand what the season is and what he has warned us about. The world's in bad shape. We know that. There's a lot going on that's bad. So we watch, be sober, see things as they are. But most of all, he says to put on the breastplate of faith and love. You need to know who is in charge, and it's not the leaders of this nation. It's not the U.N., we need to know who is in charge. How many of you believe that God is bigger than the booger man? Yeah. He's bigger than the national, national leaders. I mean, he could just blink and the whole thing would be. Yeah. So I don't think he's up there wringing his hands like, oh, no, what am I going to do about this? So we need to know who's in charge, and it's not the leaders of this nation or the U.N. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you to not be shaken in your mind or troubled. Come on. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Yes. Come on. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. All right, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you that where I go, you can be with me also. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus. But don't be troubled, either by spirit or by word. Come on, uh, whether you're getting, the, getting it on Facebook or you're getting, the, I don't anybody get the newspaper anymore, but whatever bad news you're getting, don't let that trouble you. He said, or even by letters as if from us, as the day of Christ had come, because it hadn't. He's talking about futuristic things. Verse 3 says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Don't be surprised when we see a decline in Christianity like we're seeing right now. He told us this would happen. All right? And also that the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Now, that's going to be an individual person, you understand. There's also an attitude of that. There are people right now that exalt themselves above God, and they are telling God to get out. We're going to make our rules for ourselves. They oppose against God, and they place themselves above God. <clears throat> and they also, it says, they oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Church, right now, the stage is being set for the Antichrist. The guy, that because the world is upside down. How many of you know that? What's going on in China? What's going on in Iran? What's, every, everywhere around the globe. It's a mess. And the world is looking for the guy that's got the answers of what are we going to do about this. And, it, and I like Donald J. Trump. I'm not bashful about that. But guys, Donald J. Trump doesn't have the answer. I love them. I think he's a, he loves America. I, I, I love what he represented. No, I didn't care for the way he shot his mouth off all the time, but I didn't vote for him to be Mr. Congeniality. I voted for him to be a leader. I wouldn't vote for him to be the general counsel president of the Assemblies of God. A president, and he did that. But he doesn't have the answer. All right, come on now. I have no idea where I just stopped. Verse 4, thank you, honey. See why I keep her, I keep her around. She keeps me straight all the time. 
Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, that's a capital H, referring to the Holy Spirit, who now restrains will do so until he, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. That's the rapture of the church. And then the lawless one will be revealed who the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his, of his coming. Wow. Let me tell you, Mr. World Leader Big Shot, you ain't so big when God shows up. Yeah. I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among people who perish how many of you know that there's some lying deception today about what is right and wrong because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, America, Europe and the rest of the world's nations and kingdoms fall into that category Verse 11, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Church, we're seeing that right now on an epidemic level. A party spirit has been unleashed in America and sadly in the church. It has. How many of you know that's true? In Jeremiah 8, let's just jump down here and read this, and I'm going to get back to Thessalonians. He tells us, he prophesied this would happen. Jeremiah eight thirteen says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the... Wait a minute. I was going to go to Jeremiah 8, didn't I? Jeremiah 8, 11, I'm sorry. For they have healed the hurt of the daughters of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall in the time of their visitation. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Church, that's a prophecy of today, right now. What's going to happen at the end times? People are doing stuff right now that I, in our wildest imagination, we would have never dreamt people would do that, and they are not the least bit embarrassed about it. They don't blush. They have no shame whatsoever. I, I told the board, I said, guys, just in case somebody checks my iPhone and see where Pastor B has been visiting, I want you to know that something popped up on my message the other day, and it was just a bunch of symbols and numbers and stuff, and I clicked on it to see what it was, and there was a woman on there, and I won't even begin to tell you what she was doing. She was buck naked from head to toe. And, of course, I closed it because I don't go there. Amen? But as I shut it, I'm like, does your daddy know what you're doing? What would you think if, if your father opened that up and looked at it? Maybe her dad's the reason she's like that. And I, I shared to some other people, they said, well, Pastor, some of these people are, are say, in slay, uh, the sex trafficking, and they're forced to do that. Maybe she didn't choose to do that. But church, some of them do. And they, they have no shame whatsoever. It's Is God going to judge America? How can he not? All right, now get back to thir verse 13, Second uh, Thessalonians 2, 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and the belief in the truth. How many of you believe the truth this morning? Yeah. To which he called you by our gospel, for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Hold the traditions 
which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistles. Come on, some things never get old. And the things that we were taught should never get old. And, and there, some traditions are bad. Jesus said, my word has become of no effect because of the traditions of men. And what he was referring to was all of the Old Testament laws and rituals that the Jews were keeping made his word of no effect. Okay, so some traditions are bad, but church, some traditions are good. Living clean and holy and consecrated and separated lives is good. Yeah. Those are some traditions that we, we should hold on to. Amen. Kim, help me out here. She had a post one time she put up, says, it don't have to be itty bitty. Yeah. Remember that? We need to get back to having some modesty. Amen? Amen. And men need to treat women like, like they said, treat the older women as your mother and the younger women as your sister. She's not an object of your pleasure. She is, an, she is a sacred thing that was created by God. And we need to treat them with respect, men. A young man was checking out a, a girl one time, and his dad caught him. He said, son, look at me. He said, when you're tempted to do that, said, you raise your eyes from there and look her in her eyes and ask yourself, what if she was my sister? What if she was my mother? Would I be looking at her like that? Would I be thinking about her like that? Because, son, she's somebody's daughter. She's somebody's sister. She's somebody's mother. All right. We need to. Some traditions are good, church. Jesus, God says, be ye whole. These are instructions we're commanded to follow. And if you don't, you can't expect the favor and the blessing of God. Be ye holy, saith the Lord. For I am holy. Church, that doesn't just happen. That's why Paul, he said, the things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall save me from the body of this death? Thank God. Jesus Christ gives you the strength to do the things you cannot do. These things don't just happen. You have to make them happen. That's why Paul said, I have to crucify my flesh. I have to mortify the deeds. That means put it to death. I have to mortify the deeds of my flesh. You know, I mean, we're men, guys. You look at her and she's like, whoa, man, kapow. We're, we're men, but you like, you got to take captives those thoughts. Yeah. Girls, I don't know how you think, but <laughs> I'm a he. <laughs> All right. We'll let a woman get up here and preach, and she can preach to you ladies, but I'm talking to the guys, all right? Because I know how you think. I are you. Huh? Don't feed the dog. That's a good one, yeah. <laughs> See, that means you got two dogs. The one that you feed the most is the one that's going to be the strongest, yeah. right? Yeah. You got the flesh over here and the spirit over here. Feed the spirit, he'll be strong. You feed the dog the flesh, and he's going to be stronger. So who's going to win the battle? The dogs that's the strongest. Yeah. That's good. That was, prompt. that was a word of prophecy, and you didn't even know it. See? I have no idea where I am. Put on the breastplate of faith and love. I'm almost done. Are you still with me? Put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation. You're not going to win the battle for the soul of America in the White House, no matter who the president is. Church, that should encourage you. You will not win the battle for the soul of America in the House of Delegates, in the Senate, Supreme Court or any other office. Now, if it's up to me, I would prefer to have some person in there that I would like to see in there. I think that you can stay these things off when, because the Bible tells you righteousness exalts a nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, so if you've got somebody in there that has, doesn't have any reverence for God, it does make a difference. I'm not saying that it doesn't. It does. And we need to be in politically involved. The church doesn't need to be un unconnected politically. In fact, we need to be more involved in the world because we are children of the light. We see what's going on when the world doesn't. They're buying into the lie. Yeah. 
So they have no idea who ought to be in those positions of authority. We do because our eyes are open. We're sober. We're children of the light. We know if somebody's good for the country and if they're not. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be politically involved, but what I'm saying is if you're fighting for the soul of the nation, it is going to be done not through legislature. You can't legislate righteousness. Do you understand? The Crusaders tried that. That's what the Crusades was all about. They was trying to force people to become Christians. You can't force righteousness. It does help. <laughs> It keeps restraining the evil one, and the Bible teaches us that, and it holds back evil. But also, if the leaders of the nation are evil, like they were in Rome, it, it doesn't destroy the, the nation. Because Rome was evil, but the church grew. The, the, and I talked the other day about other nations, and those, so there's people in those nations listening to us this morning. For example, China. There's, there's people in China that's listening. There's people in Iran. We, we watched the Voice of the Martyrs, a film the other day about a missionary who went to Iran, and he was thrown in prison by the Iranian government. And after a long period of time and a lot of battles, they set him free, and on his way home, he was on the plane with a group of Iranian men who apologized to him for the way he had been treated by their government. Said, we are, we're sorry. We want you to know that's not the heart of the Iranian people. We are so sorry for what they did to you. All right? And the Chinese people are like that. So, so when I say China, I don't mean the Chinese people, their government. When I say America, I don't mean the American people. I mean our government. You understand? And so we, we, we see these things that's, that's going on, the evil that's in them, the church still grows in spite of it because there's a lot of evil stuff going on by the Chinese government right now. What they're doing to Hong Kong is it's unthinkable. The persecution that they're doing. But in the midst of that, there's an underground church and revival that's going on. There's revival in India. There's revival in all these places. There's revival in Iran. So just because we're, there's evil leaders that doesn't crush the church either. The church grows. Usually it grows more in times of persecution than it does in times of prosperity. We may very well be on the brink of a revival in America because of the sin in the nation. God knows we need it. Amen. National leaders cannot stop the Holy Spirit, nor can they force you to serve him. Rome didn't stop it, and the Crusades couldn't force people to accept it. The fact is, the fate of this nation and all nations has been foretold in Scripture. The nation itself, we know what it's going to do in all nations. All nations will come against Jerusalem eventually. Because people will, well, America, according to Scripture, all the nations will turn on Israel. In Zechariah's prophecy, and said, this will be the fate of the nations that is fought against Israel. Their skin will be consumed while they stand on their feet. The eyes will be consumed from the holes in their eye, and their tongue will be consumed. I don't know if that's describing a nuclear explosion or what. I believe it's just the wrath of God. So what are we to do? Well, let's follow the man on the donkey. Between now and then, he told us in Matthew 28, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, yeah. baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Everybody say all things. Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you and Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Amen. How many of you believe that Jesus is the answer Amen. for the world today? Yes. It's a song. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. I believe that. Winning the heart of the people one by one is the soul of the nation. 
There's been revivals in the past that's done that. Jeannie and I was just talking the other day that said our daughter thinks it's pretty cool that we were Jesus people. I talked about that the other day. I preached a sermon a few weeks ago about this is that. How many of y'all were here for that message? This is that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters prophesy. Old men dream dreams. Young men see visions. This is that. And, and, and the progression of how the Holy Spirit is still being poured out. And in the 1960s, you had all the hippies and the flower children. We went to our family reunion, and we, years later, I mean, 40 years later, we had a family reunion, and it was a young couple. She said, I remember you and her. Y'all were the flower children that came to the family reunion. Because <laughs> I had hair back then, and it was down to here, you know. My hip hugger, blue jeans on, my Jesus sandals, my tank top T-shirt, and my beat. I had a big old wood cross on there because I'd... I was at the family reunion, and one of my cousins saw my long hair. She thought I was a pothead. Well, there was a term, you're a freak. You know, you're a freak. That means you're a pothead, you know. And she's looking out the window, and she said, Bernie is a freak. I looked at her, I said, you're right, I'm a Jesus freak. Hallelujah. Because we became followers of Christ, and they were called Jesus people. Amen. So there's been some great revivals. It has swept the nation. Jesus' culture was one of those, the, the Jesus people. During the time of uh, George Whitfield, it was said in New York that you couldn't walk up. In New York now, get this. You couldn't walk up and down any street without hearing from every house songs of praise and people giving glory to God. During the Great Awakening. God, give us a revival again. God, we need a revival. America needs to repent. America needs to wake up. Because it's a really bad idea to provoke God. Amen. So let me close with this. <clears throat> if you want to change a nation, you change the heart of the people who live in that nation. He told us to stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught. Verse 11, he says, then, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another. Edify means to charge, to build up one another, just as you also are doing. In other words, continue to encourage each other. Come on, we need to be tender hearted. We need to be kind to each other. People's got enough going on in their life without us getting mad at each other and being against each other. And, and there's some stuff going on. There's some stuff going on in people that's affiliated with this ministry. You just need to forgive each other. And just stop. Come on, why don't we try to do what he told us to do? And to stand feeling like I'm entitled. I have a right to be angry. Well, God's got a right to be angry at you. But he forgave you for Christ's sake. And commanded you that you forgive others just as God for Christ's sake forgave you. So therefore, you don't have a right. Do you? Huh? Now, I'm not to talking to anybody in here. Some of you might be listening at home. You sh well, you need to forgive. Make it right. If they don't accept your forgiveness, that's on them. I learned a lesson about forgiveness a long time ago because I was a very, very unforgiving person. I was the guy that if you did me wrong, I'm going to get you. Payback. And it was eating my lunch. And people had wronged me, and I was like, God, I, I can't. It's, it's a human impossible. I can't forgive them. And the Lord taught me that it's got nothing to do with how you feel. It's got nothing to do with how you think. It all has to do with your choice. And I learned that it all begins with speaking it out of your mouth. I said, well, God, and this is the way I pray, God, you know I don't mean this. In my heart, I don't mean this. But because you commanded me to forgive them, I choose to forgive them. And church, I'm telling you, if you do that, it'll sow a seed in you. And if you keep practicing that, it will become so real that eventually, not only had I truly forgiven them in my heart, that I was praying for them, that God would bless them. God would bless their home, bless their family. 
It may not have done a thing for them. They may still hate me, some of them. Some of you might be watching. You might still hate me. <laughs> All right. But it changed me. It's time for us to be kind one to another. Tender. Don't be hard-hearted. Forgive one another. Just as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Church, maybe, the, maybe what I preached about the nation has got nothing to do with what we need to really hear today. But this week, I know God spoke that into my spirit. Harden not your heart as in the provocation when my children wandered in the wilderness. They saw my miracles for 40 years. 40 years. But they tempted me, he said, and they tested me. And therefore, he poured his wrath out on them. So that he said, they shall not enter my rest. Church needs to put this into practice. Because you can't change a nation until you change the heart of the nation. And the way you change the heart of the nation is you change the heart of the people in that nation. By standing fast and holding the traditions of men. All right, and he told us to comfort each other, edify one another, just as you're so doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and those that are over you in the Lord admonish you. And they admonish you. Come on, and they admonish you. Sometimes God has the pastor admonish you. It's part of his job, Amen. You need to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. So well, I can't stand that, Pastor. Well, it's not about me. It's about the work God's called me to do. Be at peace among yourself. How are you going to do that? Start doing what God told you to do. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. But always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. And he who calls you is faithful. He also will do it. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please? God is good all the time. And because he dwells in me, I ought to be good all the time too, right? Hunter, take us to the throne of grace. Let's sing a song of worship.
As I was uh, covering material today and just some things just popping into my head, and then how many of you said, I've got some work to do? Huh? Yeah. Well, if it makes you feel any better, so does Pastor B. We're all a work in progress. But church, I'm here to encourage you and to tell you that what God said you can do, you can do. And he has promised you, he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That is a promise that the Holy Spirit will give you the power to be a witness. The word witness means martus, is the Greek word. It means, in other words, you will be a witness for him up to and including death. We get the word martyr from that, martus. And you receive power, miracle working power, to be a witness. So what he is saying is the Holy Spirit will give you the power to do what he's commanded you to do. So I've got a lot of work to do, but I don't have to do it by myself. God will help me if I will just ask him and I will yield to his spirit. It's just like when I said, you, you take the first step. God, you know I don't mean this in my heart, but God, you command me to do this, so I choose to do it. And then... Something happens inside of you. You open that door. Jesus said, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If any man will open the door, he can't open it. You have to open it. If any man will open that door, I will come in unto him, and I will sup with him. You take the first step. You recognize there's some things I need to work on. There's some of us that we need to rededicate our life to the Lord. Maybe you've drifted away from God. You're not where you should be with him, and you know it. You need to repent and rededicate your life to Christ. If you're here, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You're not a Christian. You need to commit your life to him. Recognize that you're lost without him, and just simply ask him to forgive you and save you. It doesn't have to be real complicated, and you don't have to use a whole lot of fancy words. He's looking at your heart. God, I want to live for you. Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. I give my life to you. Save me, Jesus. Martin Luther, who, who was the German reformer who took the word that we couldn't be understood, he translated into the German language so the common people could understand it. That was his prayer many times. Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. So it's just that simple. So whatever is going on in your own personal life that you recognize you need to work on, you just simply open the door by acknowledging, I need to work on this. That's the first step. The Bible says you confess your faults one another that you can be healed. Well, we need to confess our faults to God. And he will begin the healing process so that we can work on these things. And we can start putting into practice all the things that he's commanded us. And then we can go into the nations and teach them to observe all things whatsoever he's commanded us. And if we will do that, he said, then I will be with you. Huh? How many of you like to just walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus? I remember when we were at Brownsville one time, this little lady, she was a little bitty woman. She must have been in her 80s or 90s. And she was shuffling when she came in. And I could hear her going in the aisle. I said, I'm walking with you, Jesus. I'm walking with you, Jesus. I'm, and that was real. Come on. I'm walking with you, Jesus. How many of you want to walk with him and talk? The old song says, I walk with him and I talk with him a long life's narrow ways. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Some of them old hymns are pretty powerful. Would you start by just opening the door saying, God, there's some things I God, there's some things we need to work on this morning, Jesus. Lord, as I was going over this, God, we're looking at the condition of the world, Lord. And it's bad. But Father, I look at the condition of the church, God. Some of that's not so good. And Lord, we can't expect the world 
to see the light and that the church becomes that light. So God, heal the church. Heal the hearts of those, Lord, whose hearts are hardened, who are bitter, who are cruel, who's unforgiving, who's unyielding. Heal their hearts, God. Show them the condition of their hearts, God. May their hearts not be blinded to the truth. God, may we look at the man in the mirror and say, what am I really looking at? Do I see the reflection of Jesus when I look in the mirror? And if we don't, God, take the scales from our eyes that we can see, God, the condition of our own heart. And then, God, we pray that the Holy Spirit would just come in and gently convict us, Lord, to make that right. God, did we just fall before you and say, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for being cruel and unforgiving and hard-hearted. Then, Lord, we'll take the first step and just choose to be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving and gracious and merciful and loving and patient. God, may the fruits of the Spirit, Lord, be seen so powerfully in the church, Lord, that a light goes off, God, and the world can see the darkness that they're in because of the light that is shining from the revival that happens right inside the walls of the church. God, we pray for America and other nations, Lord, that's turned their back on you. Lord, we pray for the national leaders, Lord, God, that you would change their hearts, Lord. God, if they refuse to change their heart, God, we pray that the things that they mean for evil, God, that you will turn those things, Lord, and you will use it for good. You're really good at that, God. You really are good at that. And God, we would ask you to do that. But Lord, as we leave this place this morning, Lord, and we end the service, God, I pray for every single person that is here, Lord, that they will not leave here, God, until their heart is softened. And, Lord, they've made room for you. And, God, that they will begin to develop a genuine, real relationship with you. That they'll know your presence, God. They'll know your power. That you'll make them witnesses, Lord. Give them the Holy Spirit. God, we need the spirit baptism, the baptism of fire, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Once again in the church, Lord, to shake the church, God, to empower the church, Lord, to carry out the Great Commission. We need it, God, and I ask for it, Jesus. You told us to come before your throne and make our request known to you, God. Well, there it is, Lord. I request an outpouring of the Spirit, Lord. Pour it out right here at CVAG, Lord. Throughout all the churches, Lord, we prayed for many years that your spirit would be poured out in all the churches in Central Virginia, not just here, God. God, everybody that names the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you just turn their heart toward you. They love each other. And then, Lord, that light, will be, it'll shine bright, God, and people will see it and respond to it, Lord. Now, Lord, we thank you for the time that we've had this morning, Lord. I pray for every house that's represented here today, God. Lord, I pray for their homes. May it be a place where this Holy Spirit is welcome, a place where you're honored, Father. Strengthen the family today, God. Heal the homes, God. If there's division, heal them, God. Cause husbands and wives, Lord, just to love each other, Lord, unconditionally. Let children obey their parents in the Lord, which is good. Cause siblings to love each other, Lord. I pray for those that's traveling their journey alone in life, God. Bring that special someone into their life. Lord, that they can share their life with them. In Jesus' name.